Welcome to Nick's Home Court with your host. My name is Greg Armstrong. This is episode number 82. Let me get right into it. I'm a little late today. Big shout out to Cool Bees. Michael Beasley. Look at him. Playing well. Playing for that contract. I mean, look, this is a guy who's always had the talent. But you see, when talent does not marry hard work, you get a player with a bunch of talent like Michael Beasley, who should should have been having a really good career because he's not a bust, but you have somebody who becomes marginal and just a bench scorer, basically. He was a top pick, was he, number two? I mean, but he spent most of his time smoking weed, hanging out, you know, because... The game came naturally to him, especially in college, just dominating those college players. But the pros, the pros is a different level. And in the pros, you make your bones in the off season. That's when you get busy. That's when you get ready for the new season. And he's a player that never did that. So hence now, hopefully he's matured. He's not going to be the star that he probably could have been. But hopefully he's been matured and he can earn himself a important role on the playoff caliber team like the Knicks if the Knicks decide to keep him because look they got Michael Beasley for nothing so teams might be calling at the trading debt trading deck the trade deadline and uh, always got to keep your options open you know but he, Michael Beasley Played his ass off last night, and he's he's slowly. What it is is that one thing too, and I say this about Willie Hernan Gomez because a lot of people don't be down on him. The, the the truth is with him is we know he's a good offensive player, but he needs rhythm. These players need rhythm. You can't just come in and just do what you do. And as you, as you've seen with KP being hurt and out of games, Beasley has been able to play and play, and he may have played himself into the rotation. You see. He's been playing more consistently. He's been able to get into rhythm. And not only that, he doesn't appear to be the ball stopper that stopper that he was being in the beginning. However, I also have to give the coach some props. Listen, we got to give the coach props. We don't know what he's seeing in practice. And the one thing I like that he's done when he implemented Michael Beasley, he just basically said, you are playing the role of Chris Stapps. We're going to give you the ball in the high post and in the low post. and We're going to let you go, go to work. And it fits right in. It fits right in. He's, he's a good scorer. So it was good to see him do what he did. And it was good. This was, this victory right here is what you call a veteran victory. It was the veterans Of course, um, McDermott hit some big shots, but mainly it was the veterans. Jared Jack, Courtney Lee, Michael Beasley, Lance Thomas, literally showing up, showing up like men, like, listen, we got to win this game. We remember what they did to us in the beginning of the year. We need to get this. And the veterans led the way. And that's going to happen at times. They they can't do it every game, but they could do it some games, and they did it last night. They let the veterans came up big. Jared Jack has been a steadying force at the point guard position. And and it's perfect. It's literally, listen, the Jared Jack, Frank Nilakina situation is playing out perfectly for the Knicks. He's a steadying influence. Nilakina is getting better and better, but not ready yet to take over the starting position, starting point guard position. But it doesn't matter because if you look at the minutes, Jared Jack could get 25 and he'll get 22. He's still getting half of the minutes. Eventually, that's going to switch, but it's perfect because as soon as Nilakina, sometimes, you know, Nilakina's a rookie. So sometimes he's he's wilding out. You know, he's not playing as good as he could. So you got to bring the steadying guy in there because when you're unstable at the helm, at the point guard position, the rest of the team is unstable. But So, so that's why sometimes you got to bring in Jared Jack, calm everybody down. You know, plus that mid-range shot, I told you, is it's just water. He's been living off that mid-range shot forever. It's it's weird, look like he's leaning back, but he always makes that shot. And I want to say a few things about Oklahoma City. You know, look, I think when it's all said and done, they're gonna be there at the end of the season. I think they're gonna have they're gonna win over fifty games. I think they're gonna start playing well together. 
people don't understand mesh, meshing three talents like mellow fucking uh Westbrook <laughs> damn I drew a blank and George is is not easy it's not an easy thing but one thing I want to say is I think that nobody's criticizing the coach you know how when you got a coach a team and you have no talent well, this team has a lot of talent. And to me, that coach is not doing a good job. They have no system. It's just they they play good defense, but they don't have any kind of offensive system. And you know the funny thing is when Durant was there, it was the same thing. And remember, Scott Brooks was the coach before him, and everybody was saying Scott Brooks, Brooks is a terrible coach. But this next guy is coaching like Scott Brooks. Basically, hey, Russell Westbrook, whatever you want to do. They have no rhyme or reason. They they literally play the simplest form of offense. But what happens is they have they have some unstoppable offensive player in West, Russell Westbrook, so it can work. However, every you know other players need the system. See, this is why I always push for system basketball because it helps the players who cannot create their own shot, which makes you a five-man squad when you're on the floor as opposed to a two-man squad of two elite scorers and everybody else stand around. you just here for rebounds and defense. No, the game is much more fun when you're playing team offense, which brings me back to the Knicks. What you saw exactly sometimes I've complained complained about KP this year is that every now and then the offense gets bogged down into KPism. You know, just go to KP, just go to Chris Stapps, just go to Chris Stapps. That's fine. I don't mind him getting all the shots in the game. I just want it to come off of movement, off of off of picks, off of a screen. I don't want him doing one-on-one plays. I want him to give the ball back up, uh, reset his, his post up, things like that. And what you saw with him out the game, the ball became a hot potato, and that's what you want. Now, I would never say the Knicks are anywhere good without him. Okay, so I don't want nobody to mistake in this. What I'm saying is you saw how the ball moved. I gained confidence at the end of the game because I said, look at them. They're continuing to run their plays and run their system, which is going to take time off the clock and get them a good shot at the end of it. They kept getting good shots. And by the way, they took a lot of three-pointers yesterday. Hmm. This is the team I want to see. I want to see ball movement, body movement, three-point shots. They have People keep saying, Knicks have three-point shooters, really good ones. McDermott is a really good three-point shooter. Lee is a really good, he's at 40%. You know, Lee's a very good three-point shooter. Chris Stapps, when he's when he's on the court, he's a very good three-point shooter. Now Beasley's even hitting his threes. And it's easy to hit your threes when you're stepping into them. And that's what I like about the system. When you're running the system and you're getting, you're coming around a curl and you literally, see, you got to understand, when NBA players are coming around a curl or they're getting a pass to them, they do that in practice either alone or with the team, like 500 times, sometimes a day, especially in the off season. Like, so when they're coming off that curl, even when you look at a guy like Kyle Korver, who's a great shooter, he shoots that same shot 500 to 1,000 times a day in the off season. So that's a layup to them. That's why when NBA players are left open, that's why if you notice when you see them practicing, even the centers that hit 10 shots in a row, these guys are good. NBA players are fucking good. Don't ever get it twisted. <laughs> they can shoot, especially when left open, especially when they can step into it. And, and any time I see, I could tell you like this, when the ball goes up and the shot, if it's in rhythm, more chances than not, it's going to go in. When they're stepping into it and moving forward with the jump shot, more times than not, it's going to go in. That's why people, I watch the game with some friends and, and, and sometimes family, whatever, and I'm calling the shots, even when it's not the Knicks game. I'm call, I'm, that's, that's good. How do I know it's good? Because it's in rhythm. So the chances are it's going to be good. A lot of missed shots is a result of being off balance, not being in rhythm. That's where a lot of inefficiency comes from. And that's where a system Limits inefficiency because you're you're going to be open. You're going to get an open shot. You're going to be able to take your time and step into your shot, which is going to give you a better chance of hitting it. This is why I love system basketball. This is why I love ball movement, body movement, player movement. You cannot guard a hot potato ball. The best teams have that. The best teams, the ball never sticks. So I see that if you look at Oklahoma City, that's one of the problems they have. 
the ball always sticks. It sticks. It sticks with Melo. It sticks with Paul George. It sticks with Westbrook. There's no real ball movement. Only Tom Robinson gets a shot is like he's open because he's always open because he sucks at shooting. You know, he should be cutting to the rim. Every now and then he does that. They don't incorporate their entire team in the offense. When Steven Adams is there, he gets some nice rolls to the paint because they do a lot of pick and rolls. And guess what? When you got a pick and roll and you got to pick your poison between Westbrook and Adams, you're probably going to guard Westbrook and let Adams get his. That's just how it goes. But I do expect them to be better as the season goes on. Melo had a shitty game. Melo has been playing shitty. Now it's time for Melo to adjust his game. He's not going to the hole anymore. He's not going to the rack. He's just shooting jump shots. Basically contested jump shots. Most of his jump shots are terrible contested mid-range jump shots. That's what's happening right now to Melo. He's going to have to figure out the next step in his career or go to the rack. I mean, you're playing power forward. You should have an advantage over most power forwards. But what happened is now the league is playing small. So Melo's getting guarded by a hybrid of a small forward power forward, which he can't always blow by. When he played power forward for the Knicks uh, a few years back, people wasn't completely playing small ball as much as they are now. So he was going against usually a big, like a David West or a guy like that who's who's a power forward but not used to running around and, 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 and dealing with a guy like Melo. But I think that eventually his shot will come around. His shot will come around. And I think eventually they will mesh. I think, see... Put it like this, Oklahoma City is that kind of team that's going to make the playoffs most likely. And regardless of anywhere outside of the seventh and the eighth seed, if they're a sixth seed, even if they are eighth seed, they're a very, they're going to be a very dangerous team. Because in the playoffs, see, the difference between the playoffs and the, and the regular season, the regular season, you need system basketball to win. In the playoffs, system basketball is not it is different in other words teams scheme against your system they sit there because they only have to see during the season they only have what 24 hours to really plan for you they don't really plan for teams they just there's no planning you you can't you playing back to back you can't plan for these two teams so you have like what you call like a like a skeleton plan like this is just basically what we do against this team you know you really can't plan but when it's the playoffs and you got a game on one night, a day off, another game, a day off, you literally and before the playoffs start, you usually get a few a full week or at least three or four days to plan for your opponent. That's when you can disrupt a team system. That's when you need individual players who can create their own shot. And that's when a team like Oklahoma City will become really dangerous. That's when they're really dangerous because Regular season basketball and postseason basketball are two different animals because one, you're facing many different teams in a month. The other, or w w within a week, you can say, the other, you're play play playing the same team. So basically after two games, you know what another team is doing. So what's going to be the thing that's going to allow you to keep going when your system is not working? players who can break down the defense and this is why it's important and this is why I would love to see the Knicks in the playoffs because it's gonna now we're gonna need Chris Stapps to do his one-on-one -on -one moves whatever moves he has now we're gonna need players to we're gonna need Nilakina to be more aggressive in trying to score we're gonna need Hardaway to go off because again systems break down in the playoffs because of defense and you're playing the better teams, but systems break down because of defense, so that's when you need shot creators. And if you look again at the teams that have always been, recent years, who have been to the top, all have those players. Houston had James Harden, but they fell because James Harden fell. The shot creator couldn't do it. Curry's a shot creator. They have a team full of shot creators. No, even, no, no need to even mention Golden State. Uh, Cleveland has the ultimate shot created in LeBron create shots for him and other players. So when the plays break down, go right to LeBron. 
So that's why I think that that team is going to be dangerous as time goes on. They just got to right the ship, get it together. I don't think Melo's ever coming off the bench. I think they'll be fine. I'm sorry if I got a little long-winded about the Oklahoma City Thunder, but I also talked about that because in the context of one of the reasons why I want to see the Knicks make the playoffs. Because when that system breaks down, see, because this is what people don't understand and why I want the Knicks to make the playoffs so badly. That's taken the next step in Chris Stapps Porzingis' evolution. Do we believe we have a franchise player in Chris Stapps Porzingis? Do we believe, do we have a player that could be top five? If you have a top five player in the NBA, you're close to a championship. Not when say close, but you can build around that person and build a winner. Simple as that. Not every team can be Golden State and have a bunch of stars. Not every team can be that way. But once you find your franchise player, you need to try to win. What the Knicks need to try to do is make the playoffs this year, draft a good player somewhere in the mid-first round, and get that second player they're going to get in the beginning of the second round, make the playoffs again, and then in that third year, which would be actually Chris Tapp's fifth year, the Knicks are going to have money. I think that'll be probably the end of um, Noah's contract. Knicks will have money for free agents. Now, you just made the playoffs two times in a row. Hopefully in your second year, not this year, hopefully next year, the Knicks can make the playoffs and possibly win one round. Now, if they get to the second round next year, not this year, but next year, Nilakina's playing well. Now he's starting. Chris Stapps is assuming his role as the franchise player. Hardaway is playing his, his role. And they made the playoffs two years in a row, and players are getting better. And they have young players getting better. That leads, see, this is the part of rebuild that nobody talks about. Once you start to become good, players start looking, hey. Because let me tell you, I'll tell you like this. Most NBA players will love to play for the Knicks, but not when they suck. Why not? Why would I want to play here with all the scrutiny when the team ain't good? I've seen how they treated Melo. But if the team is good, oh, I definitely want to play there. Shit, it's going to be so much. See, because no matter what nobody says, you could be a star from anywhere in the NBA. But let's not act like New York is not important on the scale of uh, building your brand. You're going to start to see Chris Stapps in everything. He's already been on tonight shows and shit like that. You're going to see all of that. And I know other players around the league is like, yo, shit, I can go there. You know, And also remember that in this new NBA, there's going to be teams that have really good players, but they're losing. Perfect example, New Orleans. They have to make a decision. I'm not saying I want Boogie Cousins, but they have to make a decision because his next contract is going to pay him 28 to $30 million per. And if they're going to lose with him, they probably think we could lose without him. So they're in a rock and a hard place because Anthony Davis is on that second contract. And trust me, if they don't do good within the next couple of years, I guarantee you he's out. That's just one example. Now, those are players that we don't really care for, but look at Jimmy Butler team was going down he wanted out same thing with Paul George there'll be more star players if you look around the league there'll be more star players that want to get out of their situation and go into a winning situation and if the Knicks become a winning situation with cap space they'll be able to sign players a player I got my eye on though a young player that I really like is Kelly Oubre ridiculous defensive player he got grit he's tough he can score He's perfect. He's perfect. You put him, Baker, and Nilakino on the same court together, that's some ridiculous perimeter D. I'm not forgetting about Hardaway because Hardaway be the starter, but I'm just saying periods in, for periods of time. So let me think of some other small forwards because that's what the Knicks really need is a small forward. An elite athletic, I wouldn't say elite, I mean like an elite athleticism type of, po- of small forward. Now let me think. Um, I can't think of one. I know y'all going to put one in the comment section so I could talk about that later. But I have been looking at the college level, and Kevin Knox is the guy I've been looking at. He's 6'9", runs the floor. We know about Mikhail Bridges, defensive stud. You know, there's some small forwards 
that's coming out that's hyper athletic. We don't need see this is the thing that people don't understand. We don't need super duper great players all the time. We need players who are willing to play within a system of basketball and love that system become a real team. That's what the Knicks need. And that's what they have right now. So it was a very important, it is very important that you build a culture and a way we're going to play. So now, in two years, like I said, in two years, if a free agent wants to come to the Knicks, he's going to have to play the way we play. Like when Durant went to Golden State, it wasn't like, all right, now this is how we're going to do it. No, it's like, you want to join us, this is how we play. And right now, the Knicks are developing that identity, which is very, very important. Very, 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 very important. But it was a very good victory. The Knicks are 16 and 13 this late in the season. Like I said, there's a chance to get these victories because we're playing teams that that we should beat. And at the same time, Chris Stapps is able to rest. I think cancer probably needed a little rest. too. That's probably why he didn't come back in the game. But it's 16 and 13. Enjoy it, folks, because guess what? They can lose their next 10 or win the next 10. You don't know what might happen. So I enjoy every victory. This was a good victory. Anytime they win, this was a vet. Like I said, it was a veteran victory. It really wasn't. I didn't see big moments from the young guys that much. Except for Dougie. Dougie. <laughs> you know. So I'm impressed by the victory. We got another game coming up tomorrow. Let's try to win that one. Chris Stapps will be coming back. I'm concerned about Hardaway. I hope he can come back and be healthy because he's always been healthy in his career. So this injury must be something different for him, you know. But we're looking good. We're looking good. We're looking very, very good. And I don't want to trade Courtney Lee. I know a team is going to call about. There's going to be teams that's going to call about Quinn. They're going to call about uh, Courtney Lee. They might even call about Beasley. And guess what? I don't want to trade them. Even for a first-round draft pick, because I know we're not going to get a first-round draft pick, first of all. And there's no team that's, let me see, like Oklahoma City, he fits perfect with them. They don't have a pick to give us. To my Courtney Lee, he, he would fit perfect with Oklahoma City. But, see, that's the thing. The teams that might offer a first-round pick are going to offer us, it's going to be late 20s. Why would I do that? When Courtney Lee is one of the leaders on the team, he's playing well, and he's a support piece that we need. Folks, it's about winning now. It's always been about winning now without compromising your future. It's not about trading and getting a bunch of young players. No, it's about winning and building a winning culture and expecting to win when you step on the court. That's what the Knicks are trying to develop. Big shout out to Jeff Hornacek. He's doing his thing. I got to respect it. That's why I never question a coach when he benches a player or doesn't play a player because I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I'm only analyzing what I see on the court. And what I'm seeing on the court, I'm very impressed with. The veterans are on the same page. The young is on the same page. They got camaraderie. This is a team, folks. And that brings me to the end of this podcast. Nick's Home Court, episode number 82. I'm your host. My name is Greg Armstrong. Everybody take care. Peace.